Welcome to Sew and Tell, where sewists from fashion, theater, and indie sewing bring their different perspectives to the hottest topics in the sewing community. I'm Kate Zynard. I'm Amanda Carestio. And I'm Meg Healy. Today on the podcast, we're talking all things sergers and surging with a very, very special guest, FAF educator, sew daily instructor, serger, and machine embroidery expert, Katrina Walker. <laughs> Katrina, thanks so much for joining us. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. Thank you very much, Meg. <laughs> I'm just noticing your wallpaper. Are those scissors? Yes. Think, yeah. Well, behind me, so behind cute. me is... It's uh, argyle with scissors, buttons, and pins. And then I'll actually, you can't see it, but just to <gasps> my right is, is vintage sewing machines and vintage faf ads. Oh. Well, actually, I could show you. So cute. That is amazing. Well, awesome. Well, I am super excited to talk about sergers. Oh, yeah. Because I kind of love them. Um, why don't we go ahead and hop in? Let's do it. Yeah, let's do it. All right. Well, this episode will release in April, which is also known as National Serger Month. Um, so let's talk about sergers and surging and all that lovely stuff. Um, in this segment, I've got a couple of questions for kind of everybody, more general questions. And then I have a few for you specifically, Katrina. So let's get started. First off, I want to know, this is for everyone. Do you love sergers? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, me too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too. Um, uh, yeah. How could you not? I, you know, I was, I was thinking about this and I was, I didn't actually start using a serger until fairly recently. Like I did a lot of garment sewing with just my conventional sewing machine. I'm not sure. <gasps> what took me so long? Because like serger is totally my so practical, so fast. Like that's that's how I sew. So I don't know what I was waiting for. Who knows? Yeah, I can't yeah. even I can't even imagine not having a serger. I I just I don't I don't know how I would do. I was just gonna say, I mean, the serger is it is it's the ultimate like quick and dirty instant gratification sewing machine or machine for mm -hmm. sewing, I should say. Totally. Yeah. I mean just that's... just until it becomes unthreaded. <laughs> then I'm yeah, like there is that. <laughs> <gasps> not oh. not so much instant gratification at that point. No, but, no, yeah, no, no, no. But, <laughs> but worth it. Worth worth rethreading. <laughs> yep. Absolutely. Well, you know, I will say um before I had a serger, I was I was kind of intimidated by them. I think part of it was that I learned how to use a conventional sewing machine from my mom and she wasn't a serger user. So, I didn't really have anyone to kind of walk me through those initial steps, but I I also think I was just I was a little intimidated. Um did anyone else have that experience? It, my yes, I so I started in the theater, and so when I was learning to sew on a conventional sewing machine, I was being taught at the same time to use a serger, um, and so mm. I didn't have that experience of well, I know how to use this machine, but I don't know how to use this other machine. But we certainly had fewer sergers in the shop, and so you kind of used them only when you had to, and also they were industrial. And industrial sergers can be, mm -hmm. hmm, they go fast. Um, they go very fast. <laughs> um, and so that that whole um, worrying about being able to control the speed on it was a little intimidating. But once I got into the next costume shop I worked in, we had um, sergers that were not industrial, um, that were kind of home sewing style sergers. And then after that, I got to be very comfortable with them. Yeah, actually, it was it was kind of funny because as as fate would have it, I actually became more proficient proficient with a serger before I truly became proficient with a sewing machine. Because back, I'm gonna betray my age here, but so back in the eighties, <laughs> um, my mom um, bought a serger, and you know back then, believe it or not, stirrup pants were the big thing, and so and you could still get oh, yeah. fabric pretty much at the local 
equivalent of the five and dime. It's not what it was called where I was from. But at any rate, that kind of story, they still carried fabric. So it was easy to get fabric. And um, so I probably whipped out more like sweatshirt tunics and stirrup pants than any, you know, 20 seamstresses because she had the serger. I was in junior high school or late junior high. And like, so I didn't even, you know, ignorance is bliss. If no one tells you you're supposed to be afraid of this thing, it's just another piece of machinery, big deal, you know? So, <laughs> so basically, you know, I was surging my little heart out, you know, all through high school and everything else. And, and like I said, before I even really bothered to become truly a, a sewing machine proficient. So it, it's kind of funny because I didn't realize until I was an adult working as a sewing professional how many people were absolutely terrified of their surgers and half of them hadn't even ever had them out of the box. And I just <laughs> thought, wow, you know, again, ignorance wow. is bliss. Ignorance is bliss. You know, learn when you're a kid. Mm. <laughs> That's definitely a good way to go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think I, when I was taking sewing lessons, I was right on the serger when I was um, 10 learning how to sew. I always, always loved it. And I have an industrial one. And even though it's ripped my fingernail off, I'm still not scared of it. <laughs> I remember when that happened, Meg. That was just yeah. like a few years ago, right? Yeah, that was yeah, a couple years ago. Oh. Well, See, and, yeah, my is, husband is always... Scary. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's totally... My husband is always afraid. Um, he, he's a little afraid of my surgery because, you know, there's a knife and it goes up and down real fast. And right. I'm like, honey... You'd really have to stick your finger under there and be trying to come in contact with that. And he's like, it doesn't matter. It's still scary. <laughs> okay. But I've taught him how to use the searcher and he likes it now. Yeah, it would take at least a little bit of effort. <laughs> I mean, I'm not saying obviously that it, <laughs> it can't be done and probably I'm sure it has been done, but <laughs> yeah. The, there's a whole foot I there that's say that, supposed um, to be keeping that from happening. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. I think... <laughs> Um, my sons are um, interested in the serger for that very reason. They're like, show me where the knife is. And I point <gasps> it to the, you know, out to them and they're like, ooh. And of course, it um, it probably, my serger needs oil. And so it kind of sounds like a helicopter right now. So I oh, think no. that's also <laughs> impressive to them. <laughs> um, but I was, I was intimidated. I think all the, all the thread spools all the mm -hmm. threading that needed to be done. Um, it was really, it, it was totally new and different to me, or so it seemed. Um, let's talk about kind of who needs a serger, because I think I had some misconceptions about that when I, when I did um, finally make the jump over to serging. But what do you, what do you think about this question? Who, who was a serger for? Who would benefit from, from getting one and you know, taking it out of the box and actually using it. Well, I mean, anybody can benefit from use, from having a serger and using a serger. Now, now the one thing that that I, um, you know, I mean, obviously, I'm into sergers. I just published a book within the last year and all that good stuff. But you know, too many times I think sometimes people see sergers as an either or thing with their sewing machine. And it's like the serger is the perfect. It's like your bestie. It's the sewing machine's bestie. And so I don't like to see this like almost like this competition, like, well, if I'm using my surgery, I'm not using my sewing. It's like, no, 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 no. They're besties. And so, I mean, it really, everyone needs one. I don't care if you're a garment sewist or a crafter or a quilter. There's some application that the serger can do. I mean, if nothing else, you can whip out tablecloths and matching napkin sets and give them to your friends, you know, <laughs> for gifts or what have you. I mean, you can finish totally. your raw edges before you throw it in the lawn you and throw your and pre-wash your fabrics. You know, you can, there's just, besides, of course, I mean, for me, the serger really, um, because obviously I do a lot of machine embroidery. I do, you know, designer quality sewing on my regular machine, but, you know, Serger is my instant gratification. That's that's like when I want to whip out a bunch of knit tops to wear on camera because they're comfortable and they look nice. You know, it's serger time, baby. <laughs> so it's like there's just, I mean, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
I like that um, the sewing machine and the and the uh, serger are besties. I I think actually one of the great tragedies of my current life is that my sewing room is very small and I don't have space for multiple tables. Um, mm. So my serger has to live um, in a different room in the house and actually usually lives in its box and I only take it out when I actually need to use it because of space issues. And so what I would love mm-hmm. to do is have my serger sitting at a table next to me so I could literally roll my chair over there, do what I need to do, oh, yeah. roll back to the sewing uh-huh. machine and just have everything threaded and matching colors and um, not have to worry about all of that stuff. And someday when I'm in a different house, that is what I am going to have and it will be wonderful. Well, you know, you don't have, it doesn't take that much space. I mean, actually one Indeed. of my favorite setups was um, I had a fairly, I mean, most of this is the first time in my life the last 10 years or so I've had this incredible sewing space but you know I've sewn in everything from bedroom closets to you know you know, the corner of the living room you know the, the usuals but you know one of my favorite setups is literally just 90 degrees like literally just enough room to pivot surge so I'm not even getting up <laughs> yeah. and that's actually I still sew like that where I, I have them literally <laughs> next to each other 90 degrees you know back and forth so you'll find a way. Mm-hmm. I Yes, I'm sure. But my my problem comes down to this is a strangely shaped room. And next to my sewing machine table, which I'm actually sitting at right now with my sewing machine dropped, um, I, have, I have a couple of feet and then I've got the closet. And so, uh, and then there's a wall right here on the other side. So there's just... There's, there's not really a way to do that, especially because my collapsing cutting table fits in this space when I'm not using it. So it's, uh, it, it's, I, I've done the most I can do with this room, um, but someday, someday. Mm-hmm. Yes. Well, I will say that I was one of those people who didn't really realize that even after I got a serger, I was going to need to use my sewing machine um, because I didn't get a serger with hemming options it was Mm. really for you know seam finishing and um for very basic um, sewing seams so i didn't so that was one thing i got wrong um the other thing that i got wrong um was that i i really thought that in order to sew any knits at all i really needed a serger and i will say that um i've definitely i sew knits on my conventional sewing machine all the time. That doesn't take away from the value that, you know, I have for my um, serger that I have, but I wish I'd been sewing knits a lot longer than I have. Oh, Cause yeah. I just thought, you know, I have to have a serger for this. Um, but that, that being said, serging has definitely made my life easier and I use it just as much for woven projects. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I, oh, I just, I just want to go serve something right now. <laughs> <laughs> totally. I, yeah, I'm, I'm a huge fan of the, yeah, I'm a huge fan of like the big the roll across my studio to the searcher on a roll. <laughs> There's just something about, I push away and then I roll, except my husband took my rolly chair, so I need to get that back, but oh. I love that. <laughs> it's fun. Totally. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, let's. Let's talk a little bit about how surging has impacted your sewing process. Are you faster? Do you feel like you can get better finishes? Kind of what, how has it changed your approach to sewing? I think one major way it's it's changed my approach to sewing is um, some of the techniques you use for surging. Well, number one, I'm not a big pinner. And I think a lot of that is because, again, you know, I started out making mm-hmm. garments using a serger. And so I'm not a huge pinner, even when I'm sewing on a conventional sewing machine. I mean, I'll use them when I absolutely, you know, when there's a real need to. But I'm more likely to use alternative, you know, p- basting methods or like I use Wonder Clips on my on my serger. Um, when I go to serge, uh, excuse me, sew or serge, you know, it serges a lot of times when we have corners or curves, we kind of straighten out the corner or straighten out the curve when we're using a serger. And, and so even a lot of that, you know, some of the maneuvering, just basic fabric handling um, that I learned from operating a serger again as a kid, you know, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's carried over quite a bit. And, you know, using flat construction techniques, 
you know, all different kinds of things. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's very subtle, but it's definitely there. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting to ask that question because it's, you know, when I think about it there, it's, it's those little thing. And I think for me, the one that really jumps out is my, just compared to some people I know who pin like crazy, you know, I might have one or two, you know, it's just start and finish. Okay. Adjust as we go. And I'm sure that that carried over from, like I said, growing up, you know, with my pedal to the metal running a serger. So. Well, I have a, I have a lot of appreciation for just being able to get a nice clean finish um, with, you know, on my seam allowances for woven fabrics. I feel like I look back at my old makes that I just used a zigzag stitch for. And I don't know, I guess after having the serger for so long, I, they just look a little wimpy to me. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But definitely, definitely speed for sure. Mm. Yeah. Well, and see, it's funny, again, since I was, I, I kind of learned the serger along with the um, sewing machine and in the theater, you usually wash things a lot and, and things undergo a lot of, um, yeah, under, they undergo a lot of stress. And so you always serge the edge of everything before you even start constructing. And that was how I was taught. And that's how I still sure. sew anything woven. Um, it's just, it, it hasn't, it's not a change actually. It's just how I've always done it. Um, before I, uh, before I pre-wash anything, I just get searched as Katrina mentioned. And then, um, once I've cut out my pattern pieces, um, I will surge all of the edges, except if I know it's going to be completely enclosed, um, like a collar, I'll usually leave unsearched, but, um, and then that's, that's just how I do it. And, always has been. So, um, again, I don't know what I would do if I didn't have a serger. I don't know what I did before I had a serger. When I try to think about it, anything that I made outside of the theater before I had a serger, I, I literally cannot remember what I used to do. Yeah. For me, it's the ability to sew like really stretchy spandex because Mm. even when you sew a stretch stitch and you're making leggings if you really stretch it's still gonna pop like you need a serger for I'm wearing some leggings right now I can I can (laughs) I know I'm very safe and secure in them so if I do a squat it's not gonna (laughs) so that's that's, like the main thing for me when I first got a serger I was making um in high school like little bike shorts and all like it just opened up my it really helped my love of spandex too. Mm. <laughs> They're best friends. <laughs> you think Absolutely. a sewing machine and a serger best friends? Spandex and sergers are like <laughs> real bad. They're husband and wife <laughs> or, or, or partner and partner. Or, yeah. <gasps> um, so we've talked a lot about kind of some basic serger applications. And I have to say, like, there's a lot that I haven't done with my serger. I do a lot of seam finishing. I do a lot of seaming. Um, But that's kind of where it ends. I'm not, I haven't done a lot of exploring all the stitches that my serger can do. Um, There's there's a lot of untapped potential there. So Katrina, this is a question specifically for you um, because I feel like you have mentioned time and time again, and you're a champion for people using sergers for things beyond seam finishing. So I wondered if you had kind of three favorite serger techniques beyond um, overlock seam finishing that you could tell us about and pique our interest? Oh, absolutely. In fact, I can think of three that are all based on one stitch that aren't even, that isn't a four thread overlock. And that is the flat lock stitch. I absolutely adore the flat lock stitch. And the flat lock stitch is, is created by loosening up your needle tension dramatically, as in maybe even no tension whatsoever. And then your loopers are, are usually about, mm. about normal setting, maybe a little bit snug. And what this allows you to do is it allows you to surge a seam and then pull it flat. So when you, you open up your seam in a sense, and it lies flat. And on the, the, if you surge it right sides together, like you normally would sew a seam, you're going to see ladder stitches on the front side. And that's, those are the, that's the needle threads, or I should say thread, since it only uses one needle. But um, 
on the back side is the loopers. And so you have the option of surging something together, either right sides together or wrong sides together, depending on whether you want the loopers or the needle thread to show on the front side. And so if you just use the flat lock by itself, and this is a great stitch that, um, especially for, well, you see it on infant wear, for example. You see that's all flat locking because they you don't want a seam that's going to irritate mm -hmm. that delicate skin. You see it in a lot of sportswear applications. Same reason. It doesn't chafe. Um, it's, it's, it has a relative, you know, fair mm -hmm. amount of stretch to it, especially if you use, you know, a good, good old strong polyester thread in it. And, or some, and maybe some woolly nylon or, or excuse me, texturized thread in the uh, loopers. But anyway, I mean, that's just a plain um, flat lock. And you can even do fun things like if you use the wide ones or even the narrow one, depending on the, the width of the ribbon, you can run ribbon through those stitches for decorative effects, all that kind of stuff. So that's just a plain old flat lock, but you can do a ton with it. Right. Like my Ooh. thing in the quilting world is doing um, single layer piecework which is inspired by Korean pojagi um, piecing or bojagi piecing. And so you can do that with a serger using a flat lock. So, wow. so that opens up a whole world of quilting opportunities, which mm. I'll, I mean, I'm using a serger with flat locking and silk, you know, to do piecework yeah. designs that are reversible. It's so much fun. But then um, you can take that same flat lock stitch and especially if you use a two thread flat lock, if you have a two thread converter in your serger, if not, you can do a three thread. But you can take that and wash away stabilizer and make a faux blanket stitch edging on something. It's like you're saying, oh, that your first serger didn't have hemming, you know, options, but it does. You just didn't realize it. So you can use your, your flat lock and lengthen out that stitch length and um, stitch along your edge and create what looks yeah, like a blanket sure. stitch, which is totally awesome. You can also take a flat lock and fold your fabric back and you can blind hem with it. So they even make blind hemming feet for your serger specifically to use with that stitch. But if you, you practice, you can even use your regular serger foot. Right. But, so there's like three things right there. I mean, just all the things a flat lock can do, which is tons. You can do a faux blanket stitch hem with it and you can use it mm -hmm. to do blind hemming. So there you go. I mean, I just, the flat lock is, is arguably my very favorite stitch. So, so I'm always a big champion of all the various things you can do with it because I love it. Just one quick question for, about the flat lock. Is it less secure? Like I, I'm thinking for like leggings, if I were to use it, is it still as stable as the regular one? Or is it more uh, like, is it, I guess I'm just asking, is it as secure? Oh, I was going to say it, it should be just as strong as a th regular three thread. I mean, obviously test. I mean, for me with winning time, I'm working with a knit you know, obviously, I mean, the rule, one rule with surging that I do much more than with regular sewing is test, 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 because you have to test, you need to test every fabric and thread combination, you know, ideally, right. and especially with sportswear. I mean, you know this, Meg. I mean, it's like, you're not going to surge a pair of leggings without testing on a scrap and giving it a good hard pull, see if anything pops. So, you know, and I mean, so much depends on with, with sportswear applications. For me, it's all about the thread, you know, I mean, the stitches themselves are fine, but you know, I mean, I'm not going to use just any old cheap wimpy serger thread. I'm going to use probably more like a standard 50 weight polyester sewing thread for, for any kind of like performance wear that I want to hold together, you know, in extreme situations. <laughs> so, you know, it's, I definitely do a lot of thread testing and I run basically every kind of thread through my serger. I mean, I've run a hundred <laughs> weight silk thread through my serger, flat locking, ironically enough, um, I run, you know, embroidery thread, I run 12 weight, wow. 30 weight cotton. I mean, pretty much everything. So, you know, people think sometimes you just have to use the cones. It's like, oh no, 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 no. <laughs> run anything you want through it, but test it first. <laughs> and sometimes you'll have to just re-thread mm -hmm. a little more often when it breaks, but it doesn't mean you can't run it mm -hmm. through it. Be a rebel. Sew what you want. <laughs> I love all this rule breaking. Yeah. I just step up my thread game on my surgery. Exactly. For sure. Totally. <laughs> so many, so many good next step things to try. And the feet in general is just an area that I have not done a whole lot of exploring, but I feel like surger feet really truly expands what your what your machine there's, can do for there's you. There's other feet for surgery. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> Oh my gosh, yes. Well, there's utility feet and there's decorative feet. You know, I have not done much decorative effects with my serger, but that's that's a whole new world for me. Back in the day when I was 
in that age group. I used to make veils all the time, pearl-edged veils with my serger. All right, I have a really um, a hypothetical question that is <laughs> highly related to my specific situation um, and totally self-serving. But um, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, serger upgrades. Um, I'm thinking about some cover stitch possibilities for myself here soon um, and or, um, you know, a machine that can potentially convert back and forth. And I wondered, Katrina, if you wanted to speak to maybe what are some top features to think about when thinking about a, a serger upgrade? Well, you know, when, I mean, granted, okay, when, when you're looking at doing an upgrade and, and, you know, I'm with you, you know, the one upgrade I definitely made eventually was to upgrade from a four thread serger to, you know, a five thread cover stitch capable serger. And that, that would definitely, I felt was worthwhile, but, you know, by the same token, you know, I surged on my four thread serger for a long time without, you know, really feeling like I was missing out much on anything. So, but um, when it comes to upgrading, I mean, certainly if you're doing a lot of knitwear, you're doing, I mean, cover stitch is pretty phenomenal. And along with cover stitching with a five thread surgery, you also get have the advantage of being able to access safety stitches. So like if you look on the inside of your jeans, that's been stitched with a safety stitch. And so it's a combination of a chain stitch and a three thread overlock. And it's a very secure stitch if you're doing you know more heavy duty kind of garments they're going to be under a lot of stress that's a great stitch to be able to have so there are a lot of reasons that a five thread surgery is is great to have plus again there's all those specialty feet that you can use to to make um belt loops and and all kinds of things um you name it i mean there's so many fun things you can do with these specialty feet but you know when it comes to there's many i mean so many models available i mean you know i work for foff and, and who's corner viking and um, so, you know, we're, we're, we're about to come out with, you know, a brand new surgery, of course, like everybody else. And so, you know, like one thing that's really popular um, and for good reason are the air threading sergers. And now that the uh, patent expired, pretty much every brand carries air threading sergers. Mm -hmm. and, and that goes to, you know, my first point for anyone who's looking at a serger and considering an upgrade, you know, what, maybe the upgrade is just getting a serger in the first place. The, the key, key component is ease right. of use. If you are, if you're not comfortable threading it, if you don't like threading it, you know, that's going to, that's, it's going to keep you from using it. And then it's going to be a, a very expensive doorstop. So ease of use has right. to be pretty high on my priority list, regardless of whether it's three or five thread. Um, ease of use, I want to have a, you know, my sewing machine dealer, hopefully I have one nearby who has great service because there's so many moving parts. You want to make sure that you can take it somewhere. And that's, you know, a lot of people are perfectly happy um, surging with an inexpensive box store serger. But the problem is, is that the minute anything goes wrong, um, the local repair people may not even be able to get the parts for those. So, you know, that's kind of the risk you take. I mean, on one hand, you're saving a lot of money, but you know, whether or not it can be serviced, that's another story. So ease of use, I would say, um, support, you know, is important. And, you know, for those dealers, especially if you're new to surging, you're not, but if you're new to surging, you're going to, you know, they may have a lot of classes. They may have free classes, hopefully to help you learn how to thread it, learn how to use it, learn all the different stitches and things. I mean, in this days with, with internet, you know, online teaching, obviously it's not such a big deal. You know, we have access to a lot more than we used to, but you know, that still can be very important. A lot of, a lot of people really still want that one-on-one -on -one hands-on, but um, ease of use. I personally like to have a lot of stitches available to me. I, you know, I'm the girl, I'm a top line girl. I'm the girl who wants it all. So I want, you know, I, um, some searchers are really easy to use, but they're very limited in the number of searches <laughs> that they'll actually perform. And so I, I, I prefer a searcher that has a lot of um, tension adjustment options um, just because I'm that kind of person. Now, it isn't necessary for everybody. I mean, the vast majority of people who use a searcher are going to use two, three stitches max, you know, and so super easy to use. That's all that matters, you know, but I'm, I'm a little different. Um, the things I want to do, I want to be able to, it's like, if I read about a new serger stitch, I want to be able to sit down and play with my serger and 
reproduce that stitch, even if it's not programmed into the computer, you know? So, so I mean, that's the kind of thing. So it, it really, so much depends on the kind of, of person mm-hmm. you are. But, but again, to boil it down in a nutshell, ease of use, you know, can you thread it? Are you comfortable with it? Do you, do you click with it? You know, can you go from a regular overlock stitch to a rolled hem easily and quickly and without breaking into bursting into tears? You know, it's, it, that's, that's really the most important thing. And then it just boils down to how do you want to use it? You know, what are you using it for? Do you need those stitches or not? Or do you just, are you like me and you just want to have them whether you mm. ever use them or not? You know, it's, it, it depends. And, and of course, price point, you know, unfortunately, I mean, the air threading sergers are pretty <laughs> darn fabulous, but they are more expensive. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with a good old mechanical, you know, uh, manually adjusted serger. I love those because you can tweak yeah. them pretty much however you want. So, you know, it's, it's really a very personal decision. But, but again, let's just boil it down to ease of use and support. So many good points there. So many good things to think about. I wasn't aware that we were seeing more air thread sergers because the um, patent for that had expired. That's really fascinating. Oh, yes. As with any technology, you have advancements. Well, the same thing happened with, um, let's take Foff, for example, whom I work with. So in 1968, um, Foff introduced the, um, the 68 or 16? No, it was 68. Anyway, they introduced the um, dual feed to the home market. You know, formerly only commercial machines had a dual feed function for their sewing machines. But then eventually that patent expired or, you know, you can only you can only sit on the technology so long. And now many other companies have introduced dual feed to their sewing machines. It's no longer an exclusively FOF mechanical feature. So a similar thing happens with happened within the last several years with with air threading where Baby Lock, Tacony Corporation, they had the patent on it. They were the only ones with air threading sergers that has now elapsed. And so now pretty much everyone Every brand of machine pretty much has an air threader on the market now. That's so cool. (laughs) I love an air threader. I did want to take a moment um, and give you a chance to tell us about your new Serger Masterclass um, that is actually up and available now at SoDaily.com. Can you tell us a little bit about that course and everything you're going to cover in it? Absolutely. I I was really thrilled to be asked to film that course. And I, I've done other surgery courses, but with Serger Mastery, it really was a chance to kind of deep dive into surging because in my view, you really need to understand, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's not just to truly master a machine and a technique. It's not just sit down, turn on the on switch and push your foot on the, the presser foot pedal. We, we really go into kind of the nitty gritty of understanding how the serger works, understand how those stitches form, how it all comes together to, to create, you know, how this wonderful machine works. And when we go into all of the different stitches and, and not all machines are going to be able to perform absolutely all of these stitches, but, but basically an overview, um, a basic four thread serger, many of them, I have to qualify that many of them, maybe even most of them, can perform up to 18 different stitches. And, you know, again, most people use, what, two, maybe three. <laughs> um, so g- exploring the possibilities. Again, I mean, everybody's serger that they have at home is going to be different and have different capabilities, but it gives a chance for you to see some of the possibilities. And we talk about, you know, learn about what um, each stitch is used for, kind of the pros and cons. Um, and throughout the process, and then of course we go into how, using a serger and you know the basics. I mean, it's not just like high level stuff. It's also basics, you know, how to start and finish a serge seam. You know, securing your seams, sewing corners, sewing curves, inside corners, outside corners. You know, inside corners, curves. You know, you name it, all the shapes. <laughs> Let's just say all the shapes. And so, you know, and going into some of that kind of detail as well and how to use them. But, but the focus of the class, um, which I really hope people will do, is they're throughout this course, they're actually building a reference notebook of everything where they're surging samples, placing them in there. Um, there's a whole section just on troubleshooting. You know, hopefully they'll take the time, and, but you'll at least learn in class when you're looking at stitching, what's going wrong with it? You know, what stitch, you know, 
if it's attention, which looper, you know, which looper. And that's the thing. Half the time it's like, okay, I know maybe I should be adjusting something here, but how do you yeah. know which one it is? And if you make yourself a whole reference full of intentionally bad samples, you can have the opportunity yeah. to label those mm -hmm. and you can see exactly what's going on with them. So it's, it's all of that. It's, it's just a really in-depth <gasps> oh. look of the nitty gritty, not just, you know, oh, let's, let's search a project. It's, it's more, let's truly learn the nuts and bolts and master our sergers. So I'm, I'm pretty stoked. Can't wait. Me either. I am definitely signing up. Oh, me too. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. All right. Well, let's take a quick break and come back for more Surger Chat. All right. Now I feel after this first discussion that this one is completely redundant because we were going to talk about Surger only patterns, but hearing Katrina talk, you could basically just sew anything on the Surger. <laughs> totally. <laughs> Any any patterns? <laughs> oh, it's just amazing! Like uh, I need to try all these stitches and and hemming techniques, and there is just so much you can do. I have your book, uh, Katrina, and so I'm definitely going to be <laughs> opening that and having a nice read through that instead of just I. I already flipped through all the pretty pictures, but I need to actually sit down. <laughs> pictures <laughs> first. Yeah, pictures first and then sit down <laughs> with it. But just a quick overall, let's just say and talk about if we have literally sewn anything just on the serger, you didn't even turn on your regular sewing machine. You just sat down at the serger and sewed something from start to finish. Katrina, have, I'm guessing you have. <laughs> so let's just, what was your favorite surgery only project that you've made recently? Oh, gosh. Well, you know, I kind of cheat because I'm spoiled rotten and <laughs> I've been collecting surgers for a long time. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, to my sitting next to me are, are a row of three surgers. Okay. So usually, if I'm working, oh. I mean, it's a little easier when you have one set up for seaming, one set up for cover stitching. You know, and the yeah. other one's set up for, I don't know, something else. So it's it's kind of like cheating. But um, my <laughs> go-to, this last, like my my COVID survival surging has been, um, Christine Johnson has this crossover top. And actually, I think there's one on Berta style Ooh. that's very much like it. I just have to dig up the number because I can't remember the top of my head. But anyway, I've been making these these. There, there's a lot of them, yeah. <laughs> right? There's so many awesome knit, knit. I was going through just the other day, like, oh my gosh, I'm overload. But but basically, it's it's a crossover kind of faux wrap um, knit top, and I'll buy really awesome. You know, you you can find much better fabric for home sewing than you can necessarily in a store. You know, most of the t-shirts are kind of cheap, and they look cheap. But you know, for me, working on camera pretty much every week at least um these wrap tops work really well with my microphone so i have an excuse to make a ton of oh, them <laughs> yeah yeah it's it's a great place for my microphone <laughs> to clip on and so um that's been like my my total the, just making crossover wrap tops so anyway so it's all done on the serger um even the hem because i have a cover stitch and i'm spoiled rotten so but if I didn't have a cover stitch, I could totally set up my serger for right. that yeah. narrow three thread flat lock and do a blind hem. So I could totally blind hem everything that I didn't, um, that I did do a cover stitch. So there you go. I could totally do it all on the serger. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Amanda, with your, your recent serger uh, addition to your studio? Have you just sewn something complete, like not even finished it or anything on the sewing machine? Um, you know, I haven't, I, um, I mentioned, I think last time or two episodes ago that I have converted this old surgery I, I have to cover stitch, but I have not used it very much. I, I really need to, um, experiment with it a little bit more, but I will say that when I, when I was thinking about the surger only question, I was definitely thinking about kind of my standard serger that I do a lot of overlocking on. And so I was thinking about patterns that have kind of um bands as finishing yes, so exactly. either a neck band or mm -hmm. a cuff yes. or an ankle band um because totally. those I definitely yeah. can skip yeah. conventional sewing machine 
So I do have a couple of favorites. One, um, Linden Sweatshirt by Grainline Studio has a, been a longtime favorite of mine. And for this one, you probably really should um, stitch the neckline afterwards on a conventional machine or right. cover stitch it. But I usually skip that um, because I'm a <laughs> horrible person. And um, I really love the Hudson Pants by True Bias. Um, I've been making definitely very pandemic friendly and with the waistband and the ankle bands, um, you can really skip conventional sewing machine for that as well. Plus, they're so comfy. How about you, Kate? Have you sewed anything just on the serger? I don't think I have. But what jumps to mind that I could, now that I know this lovely blind hem trick, mm -hmm. um, is uh, my favorite maxi skirt, the SBCC Cosmo maxi skirt, which is only, I think, three seams, then add a waistband and then hem. Um, and so, and, and it's knit. So I always do most of it on the serger and then hem it on the sewing machine. But now it sounds like I can do the entire thing on my serger. So I'm going to have to try that out. Yeah. I, that's going to be my next thing is learn, doing that uh, flat lock for sure. And I'm like uh, Katrina, I'm blessed with uh, a couple, I have three sergers and a cover stitch machine. So that's, I have my industrial and then I have one serger set up for a rolled hem. Yeah. <laughs> so that's really great uh, for finishing wovens and stuff in that or um, finer fabric. So that's really, really great. But yeah, I've sewn a lot on the serger. My favorite top recently is the Eva top because I like how the serging becomes an element of it. So you actually sew it wrong sides together and have all the serging exposed. And it has this cool like... Um, bra top feature with these princess lines and the surging is all exposed. And so with the neckline, I just surged around, like the finishing was just a surge. So I've uh, definitely sewn a lot and a ton of Nico tops. And we have mm -hmm. the turtleneck that's finishing uh, the, and sometimes I've even made one where I tuck this, I sew the serger tail into, so it's just a raw edge. And that's what's fabulous about knits too. You don't always have to have to finish them they can just be left if you secure the end of the surging seam so that's fun that's fun too you don't even yeah so and also leggings I'm wearing my Avery leggings right now and you know it's entirely sewn on the the serger I didn't finish the hems at the bottom because I don't like to cut into my ankle and then it's just a wide band finish at the top so so many things <laughs> yeah you just <laughs> sew on the serger so that's some of our favorites you know, um, I think I'm the the lowest level serger person here because I have my very basic mechanical serger that I got for my birthday in, I don't know, like 2004, 2005, something like that. And the more I think about it and the more we have this discussion, I'm starting to think I might, it might be about time to invest in a new serger. <laughs> yes, <laughs> of course it is. <sighs> <laughs> I mean, it has been a long time. <laughs> Katrina, you said that Faf was coming out with a new serger. Can you give us any like sneak peek details of it or anything? Now I'm just curious. <laughs> it's launching in April, so um, and you know this is that's when this is airing. So I should I should be legit. Um, I, I don't think they're going to slap my hands. But, oh right. Um, yes. So yes, it's going to be. <laughs> so, so far, it's going to be our second air threading serger. So this is going to be our first five thread air threading serger. And it has one thing I'm really excited about is it has a free arm, Ooh. which, you know, I haven't had a serger with a free arm since the one my niece now has that I bought in 1995. So I'm pretty stoked to have a free arm again. And it has, um, it'll thread, of course, all three loopers, upper, lower, and chain stitch looper. So woohoo! I'm so excited. So I can't wait to get my hands on that, baby. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, there you go, Kate. <laughs> Hmm, I'll have to look into that. Yeah, 28 different stitches, Kate. <laughs> 28. <laughs> yeah, I've I've heard also um when you when you get a certain in, in your class too, can you so you thread each one in a different color so you really know like which knob goes to which stitch for for adjusting and stuff like that. 
Oh, absolutely. Yes. If you're if you're learning or even just practicing and want to really refine your server surger knowledge, I yeah, I strongly in fact actually my sergers I just taught a um a serger st stitch savvy class last week and then at for So Expo I did a I did a how to thread your serger class. And so actually mine are all set up color coded right now, but um which looks a little odd, but yeah, absolutely. If you want to really learn your serger, you know, whatever colors your serger has in its manual or, you know, on, on the serger itself for each color thread, just, yeah, you thread it up with those and then you can sit there and tweak and play and, and really see what's going on. Absolutely. I have a question. It's something that I've wondered about for a long time. Is it bad for your serger to do the tie on <gasps> method and then pull just through? About to ask that. Yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> oh, no, I've, I, I'm a huge fan of the tie-on method. I, um, I mean, the one thing oh, you want to do, I mean, anytime you, uh, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't possibly be a bigger fan of the tie-on method. Um, let's face it, who wants to thread from scratch? Even with an air threader, I still will tie it on and pull it through because it's still faster. So now, of course, I don't try to pop it through the needle. That's the one thing I don't, yeah. I don't even know how anybody does that. It's like, Sounds like a good way yeah. to break or bend your needle. Yeah, no. I, I mean, I, I've heard people try to do it. It's like, no. Um, but yeah, through the loopers, absolutely. Just make sure your, your tension discs are open. You know, on some machines, it's, it's you know, you just let, lift the presser foot. I have one that I have to push a button to open the tension disc. But yeah, as long as the tension discs are open, pull away, man. Absolutely. I mean, I think if nothing else, it probably gives a little flossing while it's going through there, you know, a little, little extra. Yeah. <laughs> a weight has been lifted and yes. I feel a lot less guilty. I don't know why I thought that was bad. <laughs> well, I've never had a technician tell me not to. So when the, when the knots would go through the tension disc, I guess I would never like totally, if that did anything to, to the tension, but you would just do, would you lose? So you would loosen it. That was what you meant by opening them. Well, yeah. I mean, just like when you thread a regular sewing machine, um, you know, you always thread your regular sewing machine with the presser foot up so that the tension discs are open. You know, in other words, they're they're not putting tension on the thread. They're actually, they, they open up or release the tension. And your serger kind of works the same way. I mean, in fact, sometimes when people have threading oh. problems or, quote, tension problems, it's because they threaded it with the tension disc closed. And so the thread is not actually seated between the discs properly. And, you know, if it's not actually between the tension discs, then, well, who knows what your tension is? So it's the same kind of thing. But actually, you know, again, going back to the air threaders, for certain types of fancy threads, you basically have to tie them onto a normal piece of thread to first blow the normal thread through. And then you can pull yeah. the specialty thread through the loopers. So, you know, it's as far as I know, it's, you know, officially condoned. So uh, by all means, tie on, ladies, tie on. <laughs> Terrific. I plan to. <laughs> um, I will. Yeah, I'm just now taking advantage of the serger expert on this. I have to I know. <laughs> All the what burning is, questions. What's the best way to clean? Because obviously with a knife and a serger, you get a lot more fuzz and stuff and guck in your machine. What's the best way to remove uh, all of that stuff from your serger? Like using a little... Back, I think I've put my Dyson vacuum up to <laughs> my surgeon before too at the little part. But yeah, what's the best way to remove it? Oh, I'm a huge fan of, I mean, granted, your your surgeon tool bo toolbox usually comes with a nice little brush and everything. And I, I do use that, but um, I'm a huge fan personally oh, of yeah. those, the mini vacuum, vacuum cleaner attachments. Uh, you can buy mini vacuum cleaner attachments. Now, one thing, um, I use them on all my machines. And it's kind of interesting because talking to machine techs around the country, most of them like vacuum cleaners. But once in a great while, there's one that, that prefers air, you know, blowing canned air. So, you know, I think you can go either way. But I personally prefer the vacuum. But one, one word of mm. advice, though, if you're going to use the mini vacuum attachments to vacuum out your machines, make sure that it's not only turned off but unplugged. And don't turn it back on. Let it sit. Um, I was told let it sit and because um, the vacuum cleaner builds up a lot of static electricity and you need to let that dissipate before you turn your machine back on. So oh. so after you clean it out, you know, go have lunch, go do, you know, whatever. 
and and give it a good at least 20, 30 minutes for that extra static electricity to dissipate before you plug it back in. So, but um, I really like to vacuum out my machines. I keep them, my machines scrupulously clean as much as possible. Those are some really great tips. So, mm -hmm. so some, uh, would, we would always think that compressed can air is just like the worst companion for your sewing machine, even though I mean, we're all, I'm, I can speak for myself. I'm definitely guilty of using it. So some people recommend that that would, that is a way that you can clean out your serger. Yeah. I've, I, I can think of one person off the top of my head just that I've met in the last couple of years. Um, cause I go around every, sometimes for working for the company, go around to different sewing machine dealerships around the, around the U S and, um, I know one, one tech at least who, who really preferred canned air and he would actually prefer to, to blow out the machines with compressed air. Um, like I said, that's not my preferred way to do it. I used to clean my surgeries out that way, but in my opinion, and I'm not a tech, so, you know, you have to take that for what it's worth. But I just, to me, I just think, I just envision myself blowing little bits of, of lint into all the little crevices of my machine. I, like I said, give me a vacuum cleaner. I'll suck that stuff out. I just, right. You know, so yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, that makes sense. I think I've done that once, but then I'm close up. And when you blow it, it just blew and it's all this stuff it's stuck to my face. <laughs> the, the <laughs> it just, and I said, that's what I get. Cause I hear it, you know, the, it actually creates some like moisture too. Uh, <laughs> uh, so va vacuum cleaners, the way to go. We've love it. <laughs> I need to look into some mini attachments. I was just had a bit. And so I was like far away from it. So I was definitely not using the right attachment, but I, but I tried. <laughs> all right. Well, that's, uh, yeah, that kind of wraps up the segment. We kind of, we're talking all things serger and what you can make on a serger and all the rules you can break. All You can break so many rules and mm -hmm. a serger is just so much more than finishing an edge. And, totally. Yeah. Um, really excited to dive into your book and really dive more into my surgers too. I was trying to think of a pun, but I I couldn't think of any. <laughs> Surge <Surge ahead. laughs> ahead. All right. So now that all the burning questions have been answered, let's move on to our favorite part of the show, our Sojo segment, where we talk about what is giving us our sewing mojo at the moment. So uh, Katrina, why don't you start us off? What's giving you your Sojo right now? Oh, I have some upcoming commissions and there's some particular looks I want. And I'm kind of a lazy designer in that I like to, I'll, even though I know how to make a pattern from draft a pattern from scratch, I like to sometimes you start off with a commercial pattern and then it just speeds up my whole process and then I can tweak it from there. So, so my la latest inspiration oh, is yeah, I have sure. been hardcore hunting hardcore hunting eBay and Etsy for vintage designer patterns. Like all the ones that's like, why isn't this already in my collection? Like all my favorite old designers, like, you know, um, like Mon Claude Montana. I love Claude Montana. And like, I, I won't, I, I no, I'm not even going to say how much I paid for a, a, you know, um, Alex McQueen design for Givenchy that I just, I looked at it for like two weeks and I'm like, I cannot pay that for a pattern. But I finally, finally <gasps> like swallowed my pride and put down some serious hard cash for this Givenchy pattern. And it's like, again, it was <gasps> like, why wasn't, why didn't I buy this at the, at the store when it came out, you know, but now I'm paying the price for not hoarding patterns like I currently do. So I'm catching up on, on all those vintage things I missed out on. So that, that's been my guilty pleasure. My inspiration is. Just hoarding like a dragon, you know, all this pattern gold from Etsy and eBay. Well, I have to say, I have seen way too many of your embroidery projects to think that you are a lazy designer in any way. Very true. But, yeah. Well, we all have our shortcuts. <laughs> <laughs> true. Very true. How about you, Meg? What's giving you your sojo? Well... I just finished my first sketching live on our new YouTube channel. And so that was so much fun. I just picked out some fabrics and I was really wanting to make another Penrose peasant blouse. And I was playing around with the idea of adding elastic casings to the sleeve, like the short sleeve version and the hem to create kind of like a little puffy sleeve, cute little cropped blouse. So, and I have this blackbird 
fabric striped silk. And so that's what I'm going to sew next. And it just, I didn't even think of that until I actually started sketching it. I kind of got to that point gradually. I didn't even have that in my mind. But then once I started, you know, sketching out those ideas, it kind of came to me. So that was kind of fun. And I think everyone got to watch along the process <laughs> how I became to that. And so that was really cool. So that's, <laughs> yeah, definitely giving me my sojo for sure right now. Awesome. That was my favorite version, Meg. Oh, really? Yeah. I, I joined late, but I saw that version and I was like, oh, okay. yeah, oh, that's yeah. the one. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> nice. How about you, Amanda? What's your sojo? Well, I am still having fun kind of working through some of my stash fabric that I've been feeling too precious about to actually use. So I am working through that, making some plans. Um, but I have to say, I'm um, getting very distracted, but also happily distracted by all of the new sewing patterns that have been coming out. Um, it yeah. just seems like, I don't know if it was spring or people kind of getting caught up on, um, a lot of people have been working on uh, size expansion. Um, but for whatever reason, it just seems like we're starting to see a lot more um, new patterns. And like I said, happily distracted. Well, I have a semi-exciting announcement to make. Um, my uh, Tamarack jacket, my Peace Tamarack jacket that I have been working on um, pretty much constantly for four months and planning for about a year and four months is this close awesome. to being <gasps> done. Yay! Yay. Minutes, oh, congrats. minutes before we started. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Minutes before we started uh, recording this episode, I finished binding the sleeve hems, which was the last um, major construction step. And all I have to do now is put on the snaps, which I don't have. So I'll have to do those once they're delivered. Oh. Um, but I am so excited that it's almost done because I have been working on it and for a long time now. And I'm, I'm kind of ready to, to leave it behind or, you know, wear it. Where, that's probably more accurate. And in the meantime, um, <laughs> yeah. I am <laughs> leave it behind. I'm never looking at it again. Um, but uh, I also uh, in, mentioned in the last episode that I'm kind of excited about the Inez uh, button down from Tasudi, and I have some fabric and some buttons and all of that ready to go as soon as I, you know, finish off this. Uh, finish off this jacket. So i um, very excited to move on to a new project and to be able to show off a finished one. That is so exciting. Thank you. I just I'm love the excited. thought of you just leaving it behind. Absolutely. After working yeah, so yeah. hard. Just burn it. I, love, I just love how you mm -hmm. said that. I th <laughs> Leave it behind as a project I'm working on, not as a garment. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's move on to our sew and tell segment. Uh, last episode, we asked you what are your seasonal sewing plans and if you are following any of the trends we talked about in that episode. So we got a few great responses. Meg, why don't you start us off? Yeah, I'd first off also like to mention we we always get comments saying that the the trends episodes are one of their favorites to listen to. I just think that's so amazing <laughs> just us talking about the trends. And there was another um question about what we were looking at and so you can always find links to the mm -hmm. art the trend articles that we are referring to in the show notes. So if you want to follow along as we talk about it, go to the show notes at sodaily.com and then click on the uh, so and tell logo and you can find those in here just to for future one because there will be future ones if you want to oh yes thank you Meg. yeah <laughs> so yeah tons of great responses on instagram i our first one from scotia 422 they said apparently one of the latest trends are quilted jackets <laughs> i'm looking for a pattern that doesn't look like my grandmother's a hoodie would be fine like the black and white trend would be a fun quilted jacket I think that would be great too. Oh, yeah. It would be so cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's see. We also heard from Fostering Sewing on Instagram, and they said, for sure, wide leg pants. I need all the flowy pants in Ooh. my life. Actually planning one in black and white stripes now, so that covers two categories. <gasps> yes, please. Yes, please. <laughs> yeah. Stripes, black and white, wide leg, flowy, perfection. Same Seemed like kind of up our alley. And yeah. I think they probably knew that. <laughs> yeah. 
We also heard from Lotus Monkey BF who said, I've been trying to catch up on sewing projects I cut out in 2018. Oops. And several of them unexpectedly follow trends. Some wide like stretch velvet pants in a pale mauvish bluish gray hue, a green organza cape blend overlaid over a deeper Ooh. green sheath dress, a couple of halter tops I cut out from fabric that's unflattering to my skin tone, but have net overlays in beaded and sequin net or just in a color that complements my skin tone, and several corsets to wear when we dance Argentine tango again, maybe this fall? Of course, the joke is that these have been sitting on my two sew shelves for the Uh last few years, which is fantastic. I love it when it works out that way. Like, I was going to make this two Mm -hmm. years ago, and now it's in fashion. Go me. That sounds like some serious living room disco right there. Yes. Yeah, right? On top of everything Mm -hmm. else. So this week's question, we would like to know what searcher skills are you working on? We hope you've been a bit inspired by this episode. I know I have. And so we'd love to hear what you're Uh going to uh, try out. Yeah, so inspired. Wanted to say thank you again to Katrina for joining us today. Um, I will put a link in the show notes to her new serger class, as well as we did um, a fun Meet the Maker style interview on the blog. And you can see pictures of Katrina and even a few of her sheep. So I'll link to that. Um, Thank you again, Katrina. This was really inspiring. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And Katrina, tell us where we can get your book. Um, the book is called um, Serger 101. So pretty straightforward. And you can actually find it pretty much any major <laughs> retailer, including the ubiquitous Amazon. Um, I'm sure Barnes & Noble, um, Quilt Shops, they're all over the place. And um, so, yep. And c and Publishing. Awesome. Thank you. Terrific. Well, great episode, you guys. Super inspired. Yeah. Gonna go get out my serger. <laughs> Do it. Mm-hmm. All right. Until next time. Happy stitching. Bye. For links to everything we talked about in this episode, go to our show notes page at sodaily.com slash sewandtell. If you want to get in touch with us, you can email us at sewandtellpodcast at goldenpeakmedia.com or visit us on Instagram at sewandtellpod. Answer the Sew and Tell question, tell us your sojo, or just leave us some feedback. If you enjoyed our show, please subscribe on your podcasting platform of choice. And please leave us a review, ideally a good one, because that helps listeners like you find our podcast. And tell your sewing friends about us, too. Thanks for listening, and happy stitching. Sew and Tell is a Sew Daily podcast and produced by Golden Peak Media. It's hosted and produced by Meg Healy, Amanda Carestio, and me, Kate Zeinard. Daisha Clay is our producer. Director of podcasts is Jared Mayer. Tiffany Warble is director of content. Kelsey Ratterman handles our marketing. And Andrea Lotz does all things digital. If you'd like more information on sponsoring or advertising on Sew and Tell, go to goldenpeakmedia.com.